Come on, y'all too quiet. I said, hello, Impact Church. Anybody just glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Let me ask you this way. Anybody glad to be the house of the Lord today? Amen. We are that place where he dwells, and we're grateful for that. I want to just echo really quickly what you heard in the announcements. That is this Wednesday. Everybody shout this Wednesday. Come on, you didn't shout. Everybody shout this Wednesday. This Wednesday night is what we call around here at Impact First Wednesday. That means the first Wednesday of every, every month is when we set aside time for this massive uh, midweek service. We don't do it every week, but uh, the first Wednesday of every month we have a midweek service. That's where we have praise and worship. We have communion. Our choir is here to minister to us. Have an amazing time. And this week, we normally have a guest speaker that comes in. This month, we're doing something special that we do once or twice a year, and it's called our 7 and 7. That is, we're going to have seven communicators that are part of our church. In fact, here are the pictures of those that are going to be ministering this week. Come on, put your hands together and encourage them. We're excited that this Wednesday night, each of them, we're going to give them seven minutes. They've got a topic. They're going to come out and just minister whatever God's put on their heart for seven minutes and just kind of tag team and hand it off to the next man or woman. And I promise you, if you've never seen it in action, it'll bless you as God will use seven different people to give you a message that will let you walk out of here knowing that the Lord really is indeed on your side. So don't miss this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock p.m. is going to be a blessing. Then I always like to take time to just to uh, greet our Orlando campus. So would you put your hands together for our Orlando campus that is locked in with us today? Come on, let them know down the I-4 corridor. And then keep those hands together for our Impact Church Online family. Say hey to my dad, what's going on, Pops, and all the rest that are connected with us today at Impact Church Online. And then last but not least, I'd like to say hello to our campuses that are at the correctional facility. Some of you may not know, but we have campuses at Lowell Correctional Facility, Lawdy Correctional Facility, Montgomery Correctional Facility, and then we do work at Duval County as well. So would you put your hands together and say hello to your church family? Come on, at the correctional facilities. You know, every week, every Saturday, we have Saturday morning prayer right here. And I invite you to come out and join me and the rest of our team, 8 o'clock to 9 a.m. right here. We take time to pray, have an amazing time. And we always have prayer requests up here at the stage. Some of the requests come from people here at the church that have needs or some of our guests that may have a, a need. Some of the requests come from our children over in our Impact Kids that write out their requests. Those are some of the most precious ones you'll ever see. But then we have some requests that come in that are labeled Impact 180. And these are the ones that come directly from our correctional ministry. So when we go to minister to them, they may not be able to join us here live in service, but they catch the service through live stream, and then they write out their prayer requests, and we take time every week to pray over those needs. So I want our church family behind the walls to know that you're not just a pro you're not some project to us. You are family to us. We love you, and we are believing God with you for God to meet your needs as well. Is that right, Impact Church? And so yesterday as I was walking and praying, I, I picked up one of the cards that I personally was praying over. And uh, I, I want to just read you this, this prayer request because it's really kind of special given what today is. This person says, uh, I pray that once I get out, watch this, on February the 3rd, 2019, that would be today. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I pray that once I get out, that God will lead me in the right path that I've been placing myself at. I'm really looking forward to opening my own business, getting a new home, and also having my relationship that keep going because it's been a good seven years. This person is praying that once they step outside those doors, which is happening today, I don't know whether it's happened already or it'll happen sometime later this afternoon, but they're believing God that God will help them stay on the right path, believing that God will help them to grow and get to a place where they can open up their business and that God will continue to help them strengthen their, their relationship. Anybody at Impact willing to get an agreement with me on that? Will you pray this week in your prayer time for the members of our, our church family that are there? We're excited for them. And one of the reasons why we are able to jump in and pray with our Orlando family and our online family and our correctional facility family is because we here at Impact, we, 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 we're family. We're squad. That's what we call it. And we're starting a brand new teaching series today entitled Squad. We did it on last year, and it was so popular and has so many demands and requests for it that we're coming back kind of with the second installment of Squad this year. And in particular this year, we're tackling Squad with the hashtag relationship goals, relationship goals. And so I want to dive into it today with week number one. I want to read something to you that is kind of the, the foundation for what we're going to be talking about during this teaching series. It says, besides healing and financial needs, relationship issues are generally at the top of our list of things that we pray about. Things like dating, things like marriage, relationships with our children or siblings or coworkers. 
And though we will all be affected by the relationships in our lives for the rest of our lives, most of us spend more time figuring out how to communicate with Siri or Alexa than we do improving our ability to succeed at relationships. There's a popular hashtag, hashtag relationship goals, that we tend to see when someone sees what appears to be a solid relationship on social media. But the truth is, God is the only one who can truly give us relationship goals that work. Can I get an amen from somebody in this place? God is the one who came up with relationship. He's the one that came up with husband and wife. He's the one that came up with parent and child. He's the one that came up with employer and employee. He's the only one that can really give us the right goals in our relationships so we can have relationships that flourish the way God intended. As I said, when we get past believing God for money to take care of our family, we get past believing God for healing in our bodies. Most of the time, the thing at the top of our prayer list is some kind of relationship issue, either a marriage issue, something happening to one of our children, something that's happening in, a, in our dating relationship or work relationship, and we want to grow to the place where we understand God is the one that will help us grow up and mature so that we can navigate this thing called relationships. Now, I'm here to tell you that whether you are a strong Christian who loves God with all your heart and does everything God tells you to do, or whether you are struggling in your walk with Christ, relationships are never easy. And they're never easy because they deal with people. Anytime you're dealing with people, sometimes it can be tough, sometimes it can be easy, but the more we develop in our ability to handle relationships and operate the way that God wants us to operate, we get to the place where we don't have to let relationships break us down, and we don't have to watch this throw the baby out with the bathwater. So now I want to give you a couple definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. When we talk about relationship, what we're talking about is the way in which two or more people talk to behave toward, and deal with each other. Relationship. It's the way in which two or more people talk to each other, the way in which they behave toward each other, and the way in which we deal with each other. We talk about goals, what we're targeting. It's the object of a person's ambition or effort. It is an aim or a desired result. And a goal is the thing that a person is working to achieve. So when we talk about relationship goals, we're talking about the way we interact with each other, the way we talk to each other, the way we deal with each other. And the goal in mind is to allow our relationships to grow to a place where we are working at our relationships with a goal that is the way God intended for them to be. And so today we want to we wanna build on the foundation. Next week we're going to talk about marriage goals, and we'll talk about dating goals, and we'll wrap up talking about work-related goals. But to me, the foundation for all of these has to be the one we're starting with today, and that is friendship goals. Friendship goals. One of the reasons why so many married people end up in trouble, so many dating folks end up in trouble, and so many work relationships go awry is because most of us have not truly learned what real friendship is. We tend to call somebody friend just because we've known them since kindergarten, or we call them friend just because we, you know, play on a, play on a team together or because we have something in common where in reality, if we talk about relationship goals or friendship goals, God is the only one that can really break it down and give us what real friendship goals ought to be. And so now think about it. Believe it or not, the Bible has a whole lot to say about friendship. In fact, it's probably because God designed this life so that meaningful relationships really are a part of the foundation for our lives. In fact, it was God who started it off when he said it's not good for man to be alone. Every time I think about that, it blows my mind because Adam is here on the earth at the time. It's Adam and God. Adam is in perfect relationship with God. He hasn't sinned, so sin isn't messing up his relationship with God. And yet God looks at him, and, and God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. The elephant had another elephant to talk to, and the lion had another lion to talk to, and the, the, the snake had another snake to talk to, but Adam was there by himself. And instead of God saying, he's the crown of my creation, he gets to come in fellowship with me face to face. God looked at him, and even Adam, he said, he doesn't need to be by himself. Well, how many know if Adam didn't need to be by himself, you sure don't need to be by yourself either? That's about five amens. Let me ask again. How many know if, if God said Adam didn't need to be by himself, then you and I, we don't need to be by ourselves either. Come on, say amen, somebody. Which means we're going to have to deal with each other. You can't just write me off. I can't just write you off. We got to get better at relationships. So we can learn how to navigate the murky waters, have tough conversations, deal with the stuff that we don't want to deal with, and let our options not be either it's amazing or it's horrible. 
Let us find out that even when it's not going the best that it could, we can still learn how to navigate through those waters and get it to a better place in our relationships. Can I get a good amen from somebody? In fact, God is the one who said this in John 15. We'll show you a few verses where he talks about friends. John 15, 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his what? Come on, I can't hear you. Lay down his life for his what? Greater love has nobody than this, God said, than to lay down your life for your friends. In other words, friendship has a component of sacrifice to it. If I'm really friends with you, there ought to be some sacrifice. I ought to be willing, watch this, to inconvenience myself. I ought to be willing to be uncomfortable at times if I'm really here for the benefit of the people in my life that I call friend. The Message Bible says it this way. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on, put your life on the line for your friends. How about the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4? He says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. How many know that friendship ought to help you succeed? I said, how many know friendship ought to help us succeed? That means that watch this, anybody we call friend should be helping us to get better. So when I look at the people in my life that I call friend, I got to ask myself the question, have I gotten better since we became friends or have I gotten worse? Has it moved me closer to God or has it moved me further away from God? Because if we really are talking about having friendship goals where God is a part of bringing this friend into my life, then we need to recognize that if it's a, a, a God friendship, God's not going to send me a friend that's going to make my life worse over time. Amen? I said amen. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other one can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone, the Bible says, is in real trouble. How about Proverbs 17? It says, friends love through all kinds of weather, and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. In other words, friendships aren't supposed to be there just when things are going well. How about Proverbs 18, 24? It says, some friendships do not last, but some friends are more loyal than brothers. Anybody ever had a friend that's even closer than some of your blood relatives are? Huh? When I watch this, the Bible makes it very clear that God is the one who said it's not good for us to be alone. He's the one that gives us the gift of friendship. And I want to tell you, if you are blessed to be able to say you have at least one real friend in your life, then you are a rich man or woman. You're a rich man or woman because a lot of what God wants to do in our lives, it comes through this vehicle of friendship, which is why we've got to get better at this thing called friendship. In fact, listen to this quote. When we neglect the divine connections that God destined for our lives, then life becomes much harder than it should be. When we neglect the divine connections, God brings people in our lives. He connects us with people. He attaches us to people. He causes our path to cross with people. We establish friendships. And when we neglect those divine connections that God has purposefully brought into our lives, Life ends up being much harder than what it really was designed to be. I've, I've told this story before, and, I, and it's in, in my book. I, have a, I wrote a book years ago called Passing the Test of Life. And the last test in the book that I believe all of us take from time to time is what I call the perfect storm. It's when you just kind of get into one of those spaces and, and just seem like all these different challenges kind of converge on your life at one time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It seems like from, from, from the left and the right and front of you and behind, just seems like you end up getting hit with a bunch of challenges altogether. Well, that's what happened to the Andrea Gale. It was a, a fishing boat up off the East Coast in the Massachusetts area, professional fishermen that went out one day on a fishing expedition, and the perfect storm hit while they were out there. These weather systems came from several different directions, and they say one of the, well, the worst storms at sea to ever hit a, hit, 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 hit a boat. Well, the end of the story is the boat capsized. The entire crew unfortunately passed away. But the point I want to make is when they found the boat years later or later on, they found that the emergency locator beacon had been turned off, which I can only imagine that while they're out there and they're calling Coast Guard, you know, you know please help us, mayday, mayday, and hoping and praying, waiting on somebody to show up. Nobody ever shows up, but when they found the boat, the emergency locator beacon was turned off, which means they were hoping somebody would show up, but nobody knew where they were. How many times does that happen in life? Life gets real hard, and we're wondering why nobody has shown up. It seems like somebody would be there for me. But the reality is we haven't taken the time, watch this, to invest into friendships so that when we have a need, nobody really can locate us because nobody really knows us beyond the mask we wear from day to day. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. 
So what I need for us to do, if we're going to build a good marriage and build a good dating relationship and build good work relationships, we ought to start with this foundation of really understanding God's mindset behind friendship. So what I'm asking you to do is lay aside what you think you know about friendship and let God give some real friendship goals for you. Lay aside what you think you know about friendship for these next few minutes and let God, let, let God use me to build a foundation for you of what qualities really ought to exist in a friendship. And in doing so, I want you to ask yourself this one question. Everybody pay attention right here. I want you to ask yourself this one question. Who are my real friends, and am I being a real friend to other people? I don't want you to, I don't want you to try to answer right now because I, I guarantee you in your mind right now, you've got a list of three people, five people, ten people, fifteen people that you call your real friends. But I'm going to give you God's friendship goals. And as I give you God's friendship goals, I want you to take that list, and I want you to either put them over here on the side of, yeah, they really are a friend. I want you to put them over here on the side of, I've been calling them friend, but they really don't meet the definition of friend. Then I want us to each ask ourselves the question, who am I really being a friend to based on God's definition of friendship? Now, I'm going to give you four traits that I believe every single friendship we have ought to have these, these qualities. Now, some of, them, some of your friends will have more of these qualities or less. Some of your friends, you'll look at each one of these, and you'll give them a, a 9 out of 10, maybe a 7 out of 10. Some of them, you give them a 3 out of 10. But every one of you, the people that we call friend ought to have each of these characteristics that we can say, yes, they function that way, even if we know they can get better at them, just like we can get better. But every one of them ought to have these four characteristic traits. Number one, are you ready? I said, are you ready? Elbow your neighbor and ask him, are you ready? Tell them you say, you don't look ready. All right. All right, number one friendship goal is, that ought to be in every friendship, is there's got to be honesty. There's got to be honesty. If we call it a friendship, there's got to be honesty. The most important ingredient of any successful relationship is trust. Where there is no trust, there is no relationship, period. Which means we can stop trying to build on a foundation of deception. Where there is no trust, there is no relationship. So there is no boyfriend, girlfriend if we can't trust each other. There is no husband, wife, for real, for real, if we can't trust each other. There is no we're besties and best friends forever and I'm, I'm in your life forever and I'll never leave you. If I can't believe the words coming out of your mouth, then no matter how much we say that, come on, say amen, somebody, it doesn't exist. It's impossible to build a real relationship if we don't build it on a foundation of trust. That means we've got to stop allowing our heart and our mind and our emotions to be convinced that what our eyes and ears see and hear is not real. When there's somebody I'm dating or somebody I call myself friend with and I'm realizing I can't trust the words coming out of their mouth, I'm looking at behavior. Come on, help me out, somebody. But yet my emotions and my, 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 my mind and my heart is trying to convince me that, well, what you see is not really what you see. What you keep hearing over and over is really not what you keep hearing. I, I think it was Maya Angelou that said, you know, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And recognize that the foundation of any successful relationship is trust. Ephesians chapter 4 says it this way. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. Notice the, 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 the pattern here. This is what we call the golden rule of communication. It's speaking the truth, but speaking it in love. I mean, you know that the, the character of Christ is speaking the truth. In fact, in fact, the Bible says about, the devil, about Satan that you are of your father, the devil. Jesus was talking to a bunch of Pharisees, and he said to them that they were of their father. He said their daddy was the devil. And he said the reason why I call him your daddy is because he's been a liar from the beginning, and when he speaks, he's speaking his native language of liarism. When I watch this, for us as born-again believers, part of our nature, once we say yes to Jesus Christ, is we become truth-telling people. And how many know that's a characteristic trait that we have to keep working into our character more and more? Which means we have to get better and better at being honest and telling the truth. But now watch this. He says, speaking the truth, but speak it in love. Have you ever had that one friend that, that prides themselves, and I just tell it like it is? If you can't handle it, I just give it to you straight, no chaser. Well, we, we get that you all, you know, thugged out and everything, and you gangster and all that good stuff, but a real friend is not going to have me bleeding every time I walk away from them. Come on, talk to me, somebody. 
I mean, I want you to give me the truth, but the Bible says speaking the truth in love, which means I can't let my lack of character and lack of maturity be excused as just being raw. And I'm just blunt. I just tell it like it is. He never said we're supposed to be blunt. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite of that. The Bible says let your words be always with grace, seasoned with salt, which means even when you're telling truth, don't be so raw that the people in your life can't open up and be honest with you because if we're going to establish a culture of honesty in our relationships, then the people that come to us have to be able to be safe enough to know even when you give me the truth, you're going to give it to me in a way I can digest it. And how many know that's different from friend to friend? When it, it, there's some friends I talk to, we, and we're just like, man, I don't need all that. I don't need you to sugarcoat it. That's how Joel Gregory and I, I don't need all that, man. I'm not a girl. I don't need you to make it flowery and nice for me. Just tell me what I need to hear. But how many know when I'm talking to my wife, I have to approach that a little bit differently. Because huh? I, I, I may help you out, guys. If your wife ever says, how do I look in this dress? That's a trick question. Okay? Okay? I'm, I'm just trying to help you out. I'm trying to, trying to save your eyes where you don't get dotted in the eye. Right? You got to watch how you say that. Come on, you got to watch. If she asked you, how did you like my dinner? That is a trick question. We got to learn to be honest. But we got to learn how to be honest with a little grace on it. And anytime we're dealing with our friends or our friendships, we got to make sure that we're not so raw or so blunt that we end up wounding the spirit of the people that we call friends. Come on, I'm preaching better than you and saying amen. We got to work hard to develop a culture of honesty in our friendships. That means being honest and also embracing honesty. We got to have a culture in our friendships where I want the truth. I don't want you to just tell me what I want to hear. Because if all you do is tell me what I want to hear and pat me on the back, tell me I'm the best thing in the world, I never make any mistakes, and I'm doing everything just right, I'm going to end up in a position where I'm getting ready to step off a ledge, and you don't love me enough to tell me to take a step back. Reminds me of the story of uh, David. David was king of Israel, and in his position of king of Israel, one day he goes out on his balcony, and he sees this woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. And he calls to find out if she's married or not. The word comes back, yes, she's married, which means when he found it out, he should have just ended the conversation there. But instead, he calls for her, brings her to his house, has sex with her. She ends up pregnant. And instead of him repenting before God for his misdeeds, he then sends to have her husband brought from the battlefield, hoping that her husband will go in and have sex with her so that they can make it seem like she was pregnant by her husband. Well, he's an honorable guy. When he comes home, he says, I'm not about to go and lay with my wife while all my men are out here fighting. So he sleeps right outside the king's doorstep or gate. And so then David sends him back out to the battlefield, and he sends him out with a message. And the message is, put him out at the front of the hottest battle so he can end up being killed. Well, the guy gets killed in battle. David turns around and right away marries his wife Bathsheba because he's trying to make it seem like she got pregnant after the two of them got married. Well, thank God for good friends. Because while everybody else is being quiet about it, nobody else is saying anything, nobody else is questioning it, Nathan, his good friend, who also happens to be a prophet, Nathan shows up one day, and Nathan starts telling him this story, right? Nathan says, uh, there was this rich guy who had a huge flock of lambs. And then there was this one little poor guy who just had this one little ewe lamb, one, one little lamb. Well, the rich guy had a friend that came in the middle of the night, and his friend was hungry, so the rich guy was going to cook up some food for his friend. And instead of going and taking a lamb from this massive flock that he has, he goes and takes the one little lamb from this poor guy who had nothing else but that one lamb. David gets self-righteous and indignant like we can do, do sometimes. David says, oh, that's ridiculous. I can't believe that would happen. Who is the guy? Let me at him. Let me at him. Nathan, his friend, speaks up and says, well, if you really want to know, you're the man. In other words, what Nathan was saying is, I, I told that little story to help you understand that you're the one that took the wife of this one guy. All he had was his beautiful wife. And instead of you taking advantage of all these women you have access to, you took his one little lamb. You know, David could have gotten offended at that. Huh? David could have stopped talking to his friend because his friend is confronting him with the truth. David could have unfriended his friend, Nathan. Come on, David could have blocked him on uh, Israel Graham, whatever. <laughs> right? But instead, you know what David did? David recognized, you're right. And, I'm, and I thank you for being friend enough to tell me the truth. David repented. In this case, the son that they were having ended up dying, but David, God restored David and Bathsheba, took a horrible situation, still made honor to come out of it. 
in large part because David's friend loved him enough to confront him with the truth. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen today. I said, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying a real friend will tell you it's wrong to disrespect your parents, even if it means losing the friendship. A friend's not going to sit back and let you dis- dishonor your parents and say nothing to it, nothing about it. Why? Because a friend understands if you're a young person, you're dishonoring your parents, you're cutting your days off. And a friend would rather not be friends with you than to sit back and watch you do something that is cutting years off of your life. Can I, can I get an amen from somebody here? A, a real friend is not going to sit back and let his friend mess with some married woman and not say anything, confront him about it. A friend is not going to provide an alibi for you saying that you were with him. I promise you I ain't doing that. If we're friends and your wife called me, I don't know where he is. So I ain't seen that joker since Friday. He said we went bowling. I have been bowling in seven weeks. <laughs> I'll be praying for him. <laughs> Come on, a friend is not going to provide an alibi for you to do wrong. You know why? Because that friend would rather see you in trouble with your wife than end up in hell because you're dishonoring God. Amen. There's another occasion where David's friend Nathan comes to him. And the Bible says Nathan gave David a complete and accurate account of everything that he heard and saw in the vision. In other words, everything God told Nathan to tell his friend, he told it to him. Notice what the Bible says. King David went in and he took his place before God. That's precious. His friend told him what God said, and it moved him to go in and take his place before God. Do your friends help move you to take your place before God? Or do the words of your friends help move you away from the presence of God? Because if it's a real friend, they're going to be honest enough with you to give you what God has said. Second thing that real friendships will bring is accountability. Accountability. It's getting quiet in this Catholic church, isn't it? Real friendships bring accountability. What is accountability? It's the quality or state of being willing, watch this, to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. It's the quality or state of being willing to accept responsibility or to account for our actions. Now, I have to tell you, that's a foreign concept in our society, taking responsibility. Because today we live in a society where it's, it's always somebody else's fault. It's my mama's fault. She had me too young. It's the doctor's fault. He, he smacked me on the butt when I was a baby. That's the reason why I'm like this. It's the teacher's fault. My, my science teacher just doesn't like me. That's the only reason why. Huh? We live in a society where it's always somebody else's fault. And can I tell you where that comes from? If you go all the way back to the garden when God came to Adam and said, have you eaten of the fruit that I told you not to? He said, that woman you gave me. He asked the woman, what have you done? He said, it was the servant. See, when sin comes in, sin nature always causes us to pass the buck and not accept responsibility for our actions. We live in a culture, a society today that does not accept responsibility. And any hint of accountability, watch this, we interpret it as you're judging me. Yeah, I don't, I don't like going to that, to that group because they, they always judge me. What, well, what do they do? You mean they actually ask you questions about the state of your soul? Come on, talk to me, somebody. <laughs> That's actually a good thing. For somebody to care enough about us to ask us questions about the state of our soul. That's not judging you, sweetheart. Judging you is when I look at you and I condemn you as worthless and no good. It's not judging to look at behavior and say that's not behavior that is becoming of a man or woman that says they love Jesus. You know what the Bible calls that? The Bible calls that fruit inspection. But in our society today, everything is classified under judging because we have standards that we attempt to live our lives by. Come on, say amen, somebody. Well, notice the Bible says in James 5, 16, make this your common practice. It means do this all the time. Confess your sins to who? Come on, to who? Confess your sins to each other. Notice he didn't even say confess your sins to God. Number one, God knows about our sins already even before we've done them. Number two, there is a place for acknowledging our sins before God so we can turn away, repent of those. But what he's talking about here is we need to have some people in our lives that we can be accountable to. We need to have some people in our lives that we don't have to walk around with a mask on with. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We need to have some people in our lives that are going to love us even when they've seen our mess. We need to have some people in our lives that are not going to hold us to such a standard that they won't allow us room to be human and to acknowledge that there are some times when I don't make the right decision all the time. 
We need to have some friends in our lives, watch this, that don't just love our Instagram version. It's going to tell you the Instagram version is not the real you. Instagram version is not the real me. The real George is not who you see on Instagram completely. That's not a lie, but that's not the whole picture. I ain't going to show you everything about me on Instagram. I'm not going to tell you all the times I feel wounded and hurt and tempted. But there needs to be somebody in my life. Come on, talk to me, somebody. There needs to be somebody in our lives that we can confess our faults to each other, pray for each other, watch this, so that we can live together whole and healed. That means we need to have a community. That's why we need to be plugged into small groups. I know you get tired of hearing me saying, but I'm going to say it every week that I remember to say it. We need to be plugged into small groups because it's not enough to come to a big church on a Sunday, hear a message for 35, 45, 55 minutes, however long the message is. A message on a Sunday is not going to revolutionize your life. It will introduce you to God. It will help you to get to know him better. But if we really want to grow and get to the place where we get past the stuff that still holds us back, that happens when we rub elbows with each other. That happens when we enter into a friendship where we can have real bona fide accountability. There's no accountability sitting in here right now. Huh? There's no accountability. The person sitting next to you is not going to lean over and ask you, can I ask you a question? Yeah, well, well, go, go ahead. Uh, well, what would I find if I, if I looked in your computer on your search history? You know what you're going to do? You're going to get up, put your finger up in there. They're not going to turn and ask you the question, who's been sliding into your direct messages? Come on, somebody. My kids are like, whoa. <laughs> They're not going to ask you the questions, what is the thing that you're being tempted by that you don't want anybody else to know about? But you want to know what keeps us out of hell, what keeps us from ruining in our marriages. You don't want to know what, what keeps us from messing stuff up to such a degree that we can't fix it and we have all these regrets later on. It's having somebody in our lives that will put a yield sign up before we run into the brick wall. Friendship, accountability. Friendship, accountability will, will hold us accountable to the goals that we said we set out to do. A good friend's going to ask you, how's that workout going? I know we're in February now. I saw you on the ground with all your pictures on at the beginning of the year. You were telling us you had goals, and I, I, I just want to ask you, how's the workout going? A good friend's going to ask you, why? Well, says, when are you going to finally go ahead and get baptized? You've been talking about it forever. Every month, there's a reason why you keep pushing back. Why don't we just do it today? I'll go over there with you after church today. A good friend's going to ask you, when are you going to go ahead and get plugged in and go, go to that growth track class? You've been visiting here for the last seven years. You know what? You, you invited me here. <laughs> when are you going to go to the growth track class? A good friend is going to ask you, are you going to finally go ahead and call the counseling center, or are you just going to let your whole marriage fall apart because of pride? See, the person that ought to be our greatest accountability partner should be our spouse. Good spouse ought to keep us accountable. I was, uh, <laughs> I was telling a story earlier about one of our couples here in the church, uh, Gail Holmes. You all know Gail. She sings on the praise team, does an amazing job. But well, she and her, her husband is Keith, and he, he lost his uh, sister a few weeks ago. So I was sitting out with him just kind of ministering to him and just talking to him. And he began sharing this story about the early days in their marriage, when, when Gail was coming to the church and he wasn't yet coming to the church. And he was like, I wasn't trying to hear all that church stuff. You got to know Keith. He's like, and you know, but, but Gail, I'm telling you, Bishop, that Gail, that's something on that Gail. I'm telling you, Bishop. He said, I, I'm thinking about this one night when I was getting ready to go to bed, and I didn't want to go to bed in silence. I wanted to hear some music, and I didn't want to hear no church music either. He said, so I decided I was going to bed, and I was putting on my Luther Vandross. And he said, so I put on my Luther Vandross, and Gail told me, turn that off. And I said, I will not turn that off. <laughs> he said, in fact, I turned it up louder. And so when I turned it up louder, she started praying in the spirit. He said, so she started praying in the spirit, so I turned my music up louder so I wouldn't have to hear her praying in the spirit. So she started praying even louder in the spirit. He says, I turned my music up even louder than that. He said, before you knew it, my music was blasting, and she was praying in the spirit at the top of her lungs. It was going back and forth, and all of a sudden, Bishop, I don't know what happened. My radio just cut out. <laughs> he said, ever since that day, I don't mess with Miss Gail. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to tell him, I said, but it, it is okay for you if you want to listen to a little Luther Vandross at night before you go to bed. Just get permission from Miss Gail first. <laughs> But a good spouse, watch this, will help us grow. 
a spouse, a good friend will help to keep us accountable so we can go up higher. Third thing that every good friendship needs, we're going to have God's friendship goals. We've got to have dependability. Dependability. You still with me? Somebody you really call a friend ought to be able to be dependent on. You ought to be able to depend on them. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 20. Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? Everybody will say, yeah, I'm your boy. I got you, dog. I mean, if you ever get in trouble, I got you, man. You can count on me. Everybody will say they're a loyal friend. But who is that man or woman that is truly reliable? In other words, can I count on you to do what you said, when you said, how you said? Watch this. Or do I constantly have to brace myself to be disappointed from you? You still out there? Remember that list of friends that you started off with at the beginning of the service? And I told you, I want you to either be able to slide them over to the side. Yes, they are a friend. Or slide them over to the other side that we've known each other a long time, but no, they're probably not a friend. Because if they're a real friend, they ought to be honest. Come on, say amen, somebody. They ought to be accountable. They ought to be dependable. You ought to be able to count on them in tough times. Can I count on you? Many times the pain that we experience in life is coming from repeatedly depending on somebody who has proven over and over they're not dependable. But yet we keep putting our trust out there. This is going to be the time they, 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 I, can, I can count on them. But listen to what the Bible says about that. Depending on an unreliable person in a time of crisis is like trying to chew with a loose tooth or trying to walk with a crippled foot. A real friend is somebody you can count on when you get in trouble. You know, the, uh, somebody sent me a video this week from social media, and, and it's a video of a, a lion. I'm going to show you a little clip over here in a second. But it's a lion, and, and all of us, when we think of a lion, I, I, I have a real love for lions and eagles. I do. I mean, I, I like all things lions and eagles. And so when we think about the lion, we think of the lion as the king of the jungle, self-reliant, doesn't really need anybody else, can handle himself. I mean, a lion can roar, and you can hear from miles away at times. And so we think of the lion as being somebody that really probably doesn't need many people around them. But I'm going to show you a clip here where this lion, this strong, kingly lion, gets in trouble because he gets attacked by a pack of 20 hyenas. And even though the lion could chew a hyena up with no problem at all, 20 of them are hitting him from every different side. And getting to the place where he's starting to lose strength, starting to get fatigued, and what they're hoping to do is to wear him out so they can turn around and eventually kill him. Can I just tell you, life is a lot like that sometimes, where a pack of spiritual hyenas will try to attack you and come at you from every side. And if you get yourself isolated, even though you are strong and you are powerful in the spirit, if you get yourself isolated, you can find yourself in a posture where the hyenas of life end up attacking you and wear you out. A good friend ought not only be dependable when we're in trouble, a good friend ought to be dependable when we're celebrating. I realize sometimes in the body of Christ, we know how to weep with people when they're weeping. We'll, we'll fry up some chicken and bring it to the house. We'll bake a cake and bring it to the house. But sometimes we struggle when our friend is succeeding. And a good friend is not going to be upset because you're winning. You're living your best life, and they want to get on the boat and celebrate with you. A, 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 a good friend is not going to be upset. Watch this, because you're dating now, and now you may not have as much time to hang out as you used to. They were praying with you for, to, to, to finally be in a relationship, but good friends going to celebrate that fact and thank God for whatever time you guys do have together. A good friend's not going to be upset because you're graduating from college and maybe they dropped out. They're not going to let that insecurity in their own heart keep them from celebrating with you. Be very careful around people that cannot get excited when things go well for you. In fact, I'll say it this way. I saw this quote. that says, pay attention to people who don't clap when you win. Right? Pay attention, man. Look at your crew. Look at that list of people you started off at the beginning of this message calling friend. How many of them actually celebrate when you win? They can send you their praise report, their testimony all day long, but what about when you're winning? See, G Jesus, ha Jesus has a message to us about this because Jesus had a friend that struggled to celebrate him when he was winning. His name was Judas. Remember when the woman came and she poured oil on Jesus' feet? And Judas turned around and says, why did we waste all this oil? If they can't celebrate with you, when is your time to celebrate? You got to really question whether or not that's a friend I can depend on. Amen.
And then number four, the last one. Every friendship should also be filled with generosity. Generosity. Galatians 5.14 says, For everything we know about God's Word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That right there is an act of true freedom. We got to realize that friendships are covenant bonds, and covenant is always designed to create a mutual benefit. In other words, if I'm your friend and I'm winning, I want you to win too. Reminds me of the story. My wife reminded me in between story, services of the story of Oprah Winfrey with her best friend, Gail. They both started out at the bottom. You know Oprah's story. Oprah took off and rose through media, then in acting and television and talk show hosting. Got to the place where she has become what she is now, a, a media mogul. But as she was rising up the ranks, see, when it's a real friend, I don't want my boat to rise and yours stay stuck at the harbor. Mutual benefit, man. Oprah got to the place where she became a multimillionaire. She tells a story that she turned around and gave her friend, Gail King, a million dollars. And she said she gave her a million dollars just because she wanted her friend to know what it felt like to be a millionaire. Then you know what she did? She used her influence, opened up some doors for Gail, get Gail on some talk shows. Now, you can't make your friend become something that they're not. But there was a seed there. And when her friend opened up the door, Gail has now blossomed. Wow, friendship ought to have mutual benefit. It ought not be one-sided. If it's one-sided, I'm always watching your kids, but you can never watch mine. I'm always whipping out my credit card to pay, and you always go to the restroom when you know the service coming with the check. <laughs> you laughing because everybody got a friend like that, right? Can't be one-sided. And if it is one-sided, watch You got to reevaluate it. Share your concerns with that friend and even be okay with taking them off the friend list if they are not truly a friend. Last thing I want to share with you, listen up to this. My son wrote an amazing paper for his, one of his, class, his communication class on what is happening in our society today that will have the greatest effect on us negatively. And he wrote on social media. Amazing paper. I'm so proud of it. One of the things he talked about is how social media makes us compare ourselves with each other. And I, I was doing some research, some study. I want you all to pray, especially pray for pastors. There's such a spirit of comparison in our society today. There's a pastor out in California here just last week that sadly committed suicide. A mega church took his own life. And it's happening over and over. In fact, the suicide rate has gone up 33% in our country since 1999. And I believe that's right around the time when the whole social media thing started. MySpace started, I think, in 2003. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat Twitter. And the result is because we got so many other things we can look to, I can look to see what's happening in Evelyn's life and what's happening in Deborah's life. We can look around, and before we know it, we start comparing ourselves. We don't need to compare ourselves. We need to lift up one another. Amen. I am telling you, when you look at somebody else's Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, that's not the whole story. Doesn't mean it's a lie. It's just not the whole picture. And what we have a tendency to do, we compare our real life with somebody else's highlight reel. I'm looking at the best pictures. You know how it is. You stay in there, take, take 25 minutes. You got to get the light just right. And especially ladies, you take 50 pictures to find one that you're going to post. We compare our real life to everybody else's highlight reel. The end result is counting sinks. We start thinking my life is not as good as I want it to be. When in reality, God has been real good to every one of us in here. He's been real good. He's been real good to every one of us in here. And if you still got at least one person that you can slide over to that list that you call friend, thank God for that friend. Become better at being a friend. And I would even encourage you to get on the phone today, reach out to that friend, thank God for their friendship. And thank God that if you don't have that one person on that friend list, I'm believing God with you. This is the year where God establishes some real friendships that you can count on. Come and lift up your hands. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us. Your mercy and grace endures forever. Thank you for your love that's everlasting. We receive it. We embrace it. We thank you for it today. Thank you for helping us to navigate these waters of friendship 
Thank you for helping us to open up our eyes to see what we don't naturally see. And thank you for putting people in our path that will love us enough to help us be accountable. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now all heads are bowed and eyes are closed here in Jacksonville, there in Orlando as well. Nobody moving at either campus except those we've assigned to do so. Please, every head bowed, all eyes are closed in prayer. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can I just say that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother and his name is Jesus. The Bible makes it very clear that there's no greater love that a man can have than lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us when we were of no use to him. He laid down his life for us when many of us were turning our back on him and wanted nothing to do with him. And even right now, no matter what may be happening in your life, he's the one knocking on the door of your heart at this very moment, inviting you into this amazing relationship with him. You say, what does it mean to be saved or born again? It simply means that we open up our hearts to invite Jesus in, allowing him to become Lord. It means he calls the shots. He dictates what we do. And all he really asks from us is one thing, and that is total surrender. He doesn't ask you to be perfect. He didn't ask you to promise that you'll never make any more mistakes. He just wants us to surrender fully. And when we surrender fully, he'll take a mess of our lives and turn it into a miracle. And we give our lives to him. So if you're here today and you say, yes, pastor, I am ready to surrender my heart and life to Jesus Christ. Then let me pray for you today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you to the front of the church. But right there at your seat where you are, I want to lead you in a prayer that will transform your life forever. So let me know. Yes, I want you to pray for me, pastor. Include me in on this. Let me know I'm praying for you now, but just lifting up your hand. Come on, right there where you're sitting. Lift it up high. See that hand there? Thank you. Another hand right there. Another hand there. Another hand right there. Thank you. See another hand there. Another hand right there. Thank you. See that hand there. Come on, who else? Another hand there in the back. Beautiful. Thank you. Another hand there in the front row. Who else? Come on, who else? Nothing to be ashamed of. There's so much love in this room right now. Go ahead and surrender to that love and say yes to Jesus. Thank you. See that hand just went up there. Come on, who else? Anyone there in Orlando? Anyone there in our overflow room? Anyone there online that's watching? You can just, just use the hand emoji, and the minister online right there will acknowledge you. Or just type the word hand. We just want you to say yes to Jesus. Anyone else before we pray? I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm going to pray for you right there at your seat where you are. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I want to ask every one of you that raised your hand for prayer to pray this prayer just loud enough for you and God to hear it. And God's going to change your life right there where you are. Say this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for loving me right where I am. Thank you for accepting me right where I am. But thank you for loving me too much to leave me right where I am. I do believe that Jesus is your son. I believe he died for my sins. and You raised him from the dead. So right now I'm asking you, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me now. Forgive me for trying to live life without you. I need you, Lord. And I surrender my life to you. For the rest of my days, according to the Bible, I am born again. Amen. Come on, Impact Church. Put your hands together. Help me celebrate. Come on. Come on. Praise God. I want to say to every one of you that raised your hand and prayed that prayer along with me, congratulations. You say, but I don't feel any different. It's not a feeling. Salvation is not an emotion. It's a decision. You decided to say yes to Jesus, and he stepped in to start turning things around in your life from the inside out. Now, we want to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. So I want to ask you to do something for me. If you raise your hand and pray that prayer, would you fill out that card we've been talking about? It's a connection card. There should be one right in the back of the seat in front of you. If you don't see one there, lift up your hand. Our team will be glad to give you one. Fill that card out. Give us the information to ask for. And just check the box that says, I committed my life to Christ. Now, we're not going to call or come by your house. I want to personally just send you a letter. It's going to give you some next steps. Let you know, what do I do now that I made this decision to commit my heart and my life to Jesus Christ? Once you finish that card, put it into the offering bucket when it comes by, or just give it to one of the ushers in the blue shirts before you leave here today. Two things real quick I would tell you that you got to do right away. Get baptized as soon as you can. In fact, if you want to get baptized today, you can. If you just said yes to Jesus today, or if you said yes to him years ago but have never been baptized, we'll give you everything you need. Shorts, we'll give you a t-shirt, we'll give you towels, deodorant, hair products, whatever you need to allow you to get baptized today. All you have to do is see one of our ushers. They'll take you to the room where we're doing baptisms right after service. And then get plugged into a good Bible teaching church as soon as you can. If you want to get plugged in here at Impact Church, you can still do so 12 noon today. It's step number one of our growth track class. It's the actual membership class. There's four classes, but the actual membership portion is step number one. 
which means you can start the month of February off the right way, getting plugged into a good church if you want to become a member here at Impact Church. One more time, Impact, put your hands together, help me celebrate. Praise God.